we have a disaggregation and a fragmentation of interests, you have the emergence of single issue parties. So the Pirate Party in Germany, the Pirate Party in Sweden, these were parties that gained significant political support. Um, so I disagree, you know, there has been a change to the party political culture. Maybe not so much in the US, because we have a you know, two-party system. Maybe not so much in the UK, because we have a first-class opposed system. But in Germany, every single generation has seen the emergence of a new political party. Uh, and you're seeing one again this time around. And that's because, and that becomes more powerful than Italy. Beppe Grillo, okay, you know, the Ita he wanted to run in the Italian Democratic primaries four years ago. The Italian Democratic Party told him to go away and form his own party. They didn't want him. He did. He's now the largest political party in Italy. That's a, that is a seismic shock in a founding member of the European Union, uh, a long-term mature Western European democracy. So the nature of politics is changing, and it's changing because society is disaggregating, because people are disillusioned with uh, traditional forms, because single-issue groups can now gain a purchase in the political process. So again, all of this presents a significant challenge to traditional social democratic parties and also centre-left parties. Um, what can they do about this? Two more minutes? Okay. So I think the first thing is that uh, we have to understand, we move to the next slide, please. We have to understand that, you know, right, these are tools, but the truth of the matter is that culture and strategy will always trump technology. In 2008, we held a seminar. Jen recently spoke at a seminar we, we had with the Obama uh, campaign team downloading to progressive parties. In 2008, 2009, everybody made a you know, uh, pilgrimage to Chicago and DC to, to get the new, new silver bullet campaign. And it was online and social media. And their view was, if we have a Facebook page, if we use this media, we can just bolt this on. Uh, and it's the new silver bullet. It's the, it's the equivalent of what polling or advertising or focus groups were 10, 15 years ago. Well, it's just not true. Because in fact, if you bolt this kind of, so to, to use these tools properly, you have to have a more open culture, a more inclusive culture. Uh, less hierarchical. I'm not saying there's no hierarchy, there's not no command and control, but you, you need to allow people to engage on their own terms. And that's a, that's a cultural change management problem for traditional political parties. There's a famous story about some US consultants coming to talk to Gordon Brown about how the Obama campaign could be adapted to, to New Labour as it was then. And they sat with him in the office at number 10 and he said, this is wonderful, we must do it. And then somebody pointed out from the party secretariat that this would require us to change the constitution of the Labour Party in order to enact this. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we saw that that was not so popular. So, you know, we need to get the culture right. We need to become more open. And we need to focus the strategy. We need to figure out who we want to engage with us, how we want them to engage. And then we build the social media tools and the online engagement from that end. But get your strategy in place first. Get your culture in place first. And then use the tools. And I would suspect that one of the reasons why Facebook didn't work in France was because they just thought you could have a Facebook page and they expected it to, to work on its own. But I'm just, just hypothecating there. The second is that whatever lives on, online must also live offline and be targeted to offline action. You know, you can't change the world just by clicking. Somebody actually has to do something. About the only thing that you can do online that's not, not really offline is you can give money, money. Uh, and the Obama campaign was very good at that. But that's about the only thing you can do. If you want to change the world, everything you ought to do in terms of organization has to be focused to, to an offline, real-world action. And the way in which you integrate the two, they should be seamless and, and that should be understood. Um, the third is that in, in, in traditional political parties, we're membership-based organizations. Every election campaign, the Democratic Party doesn't exist. It's a coalition of campaign committees. It's not a party, it's not a membership party in the way that we as European parliament, parliamentary parties would understand that. Um, so they can just come in uh, and tell people what to do or hire people to do it in a volunteer sense. Uh, what we need to do is to build a culture in which members of the party, people who pay to join, who've been there for 15, 20 years and often believe that they have the institutional memory and, and they are the guardians of the institutional memory of the organization, are involved in this and empowered and not afraid of working with supporters. You can create that into a win-win situation, but that is a change management process, not a, I know that's how you used to do it, but now we're gonna do it this way process. So you have to involve them and empower them in, in that process. I really think that we need to excavate what the leadership is about and what change do social media make to the functioning of, of leadership. And what you see there is in pages like the Colina Kaletsai that you can see there in this slide, what you see there is that what uh, these Facebook pages, Twitter channels are fundamentally about is identity building, is creating ad hoc identities that can aggregate people 
that can aggregate individuals mostly stripped of uh, prior social and political affiliations around a same project, around a collective sense of purpose, a collective will, that can become a fuel for mobilization. The type of leadership we, uh, we see here has as much to do with information that I think is a question that is uh, talked too much about in uh, contemporary debates about the internet. It is always about information, 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 as if people were all computer geeks. What is much more about is emotions. And it is about emotions because social media are about emotions. They are not about uh, communicating information to your friends. It is about celebrating your successes. It is about grieving. It is about looking for comfort. It is about keeping in touch with your kinship networks, with your friends, with your acquaintances. And digital activists are exploiting this emotional power of social media, of social networking sites, by using uh, tools like Facebook pages and Twitter channels as fundamentally a means of translation of individual sentiments into collective political passions. And this is what you could see in the Corina Khaled Said page uh, in the use of uh, Khaled Said as a collective identifier, as a collective name, as a collective <laughs> dead hero of the movement. A person that was very similar to the Facebook youth that aggregated on the page, that had much to share with them in terms of his biography, in terms of his very martyrdom, which took place outside of an internet cafe where he was killed by uh, two agents of the Egyptian secret police, and in terms of his aspirations and dreams. And what happened on the page was that many people uh, abandoned their own identity, their own personal Facebook profiles to use the picture of Khaled Said as their own personal profile picture and therefore as a sort of collective profile picture. And this is really what social media do to leadership. They become a platform where to translate, translate personal identity into collective identity, where to construct new forms of aggregation that are resolving the very degree of fragmentation which we see in our societies, as Matt rightly pointed out, and that is affecting the possibility for uh, radical mobilization. In conclusion, I would say that it is important, I think, for both political reasons and ethical reasons to come to terms with these new forms of leadership and to make these new forms of leadership transparent because at the moment they are not. People are insisting they are not leaders. And by insisting that they are not leaders, they are doing something very important for themselves. They are becoming unaccountable. They are becoming unaccountable. And this is precisely the case with Beppe Grillo. The Beppe Grillo movement, which I think is a very interesting movement, I think it is tendentially a progressive movement, I think it is a democratic movement, but it has a fundamental issue at the level of the question of leadership. Because Beppe Grillo himself denies he is a leader of the movement. I am just the spokesperson of a movement in its formation, he insists. But if anybody outside of Italy looks at Beppe Grillo and what he does, you will un immediately understand this guy is the leader. I mean, he's always talking. He's the guy, if his blog is the official blog of the movement with his own name, beppegrillo.it. How can that be? How can he deny he is not a leader? He can deny he is not a leader precisely because of his ideology of leaderlessness, his ideology of absolute participation, this ideology of horizontality, I don't know if you've heard this term, this idea of the web as in a horizontal space, which is the ideology of social media and has become the ideology of contemporary protest movements. Thanks. Uh, Jen, coming back to what you were talking about, about the communities which essentially were created digitally for one purpose, which was to get the president re-elected. Wh what do you say to the, this, this point from Catherine? Are social media movements, in other words, communities, inherently transient? And what are the implications for political parties? In other words, are those communities you created last year really transient? Um, I, you know, I think to a large extent, yes, because I think the evolution of the medium is constantly changing. And, um, you know, it is um, moving to the next new thing. It is building upon itself by being a user of Twitter or a user of Facebook. You're actually able to create and customize it um, in ways that perhaps, you know, had never been done before. So I think that 
that, um, that inherently exists within the system. We certainly uh, are challenged at this point in time, we were challenged in between 2008 and 2012 on how you maintain relationships and the foundation that you've built when you do not have a presidential election in a way that um, allows people to not only communicate in their community on behalf of the president, but to do it within their own community for other things. And so we've tried to work hard to say, um, you know, run for local office, stand up and, and um, you know, get active on in, in issues that matter in your own town that perhaps you wouldn't do before, um, actively organize around issues as opposed to electoral politics. And we have found that it is certainly a challenge to do that, to continue to keep that same group of folks. The churn of social media, of people on your email list, um, certainly um, make things um, unique in terms of the freshness um, and the importance of constantly staying um, relevant and current in terms of how you communicate. Let, let, me, um, let me put to you a comment from David Skelton that the West has fundamentally industrial parties often unsuited to the digital age. Jen, you've been working inside an industrial party. Do you think you are suited to the digital age or not? Yes. Uh, I, I mean, we've won and we've done it in particular because we've been able to uh, work within a digital space. But I, the one thing that I, I've been thinking about as we've been talking, um, one of the, the tests that we did within the campaign was to test tactics, door knocking, phone calls, obviously test metrics. But one of the things that we tested was mail. Um, and, and American um, political campaigning, mail is, has always been a preeminent um, communication tool. You, you know, you could be in a, a place where you get 30 pieces of mail to your house and it looks atrocious. Um, and they're glossy pieces or, you know, maybe they're a letter from the candidate. And we've sort of stepped away from that because, you know, we felt that, um, you know, people don't really read their mail. Um, you know, maybe they don't pick up their mail. You know, they get so much of it that it's just junk mail now and they throw it away and that, you know, digital is the place to go. But what we found in our testing was that young people actually like mail because they don't get a lot of it. And so it had a greater impact on them than it did um, with what you would traditionally think would be the greatest audience for mail, which would be older people um, and had always been. And so I say that as, I guess, a caution, uh, but also sort of in thinking of this in context that certainly the digital space is, is where we are and it's incredibly important. But again, um, it is not um, a, the only way to communicate and in fact, um, even some of these old traditional tactics that are, um, you know, perhaps looked at as, as old fashioned and, and no longer effective are actually um, have impact and in, in fact have impact with younger generations um, in ways that I think is very cyclical and something that 